Cotton was a crop that was already present in the United States in the 1500s. However, it became a bigger deal in the 1800s. This was due to the man, Eli Whitney. Eli Whitney was born in Massachusetts and the son of a farmer. However, he went to Yale University and graduated. After graduating Yale University, he moved in with Catherine Green. Catherine Green lived on a cotton plantation in Georgia. While living with Catherine Green on the cotton plantation, Eli Whitney noticed some issues, such as cotton was easily stored, but it was a long and tedious process, and the workers were barely getting paid. In 1794, he invented the cotton gin. The cotton gin became revolutionary in the United States because it allowed cotton to be produced faster, and it separated seeds from fibers. Cotton was produced in states such as Virginia, Georgia, Tennessee, Alabama, Arkansas, Mississippi, and even parts of Louisiana and Texas. By 1812, cotton was so massively produced that it became a cash crop and allowed the United States to trade globally. In particular, it allowed the United States to trade cotton with Britain. In 1820s, a new strain of cotton was discovered called the Petite Gulf. The Petite Gulf was discovered in Mississippi. This was a unique strain because it was produced in large packs rather than small packs. It became an economic opportunity. The problem was that there was a population of Native Americans in the South. In the 1820s and 30s, the Native American population was pushed out. And in 1830, the Indian Removal Act took place and pushed the Native American population out of the South in order to sell in to rich property owners. These owners produced cotton even more fast, and cotton was produced even faster than ever in the United States. Prior to the U.S. Civil War, cotton production expanded from 720,000 bales in 1830 to 2.85 million bales in 1850 to nearly 5 million in 1860. Also prior to the Civil War, King Cotton was a slogan that was widely believed in the South, which meant there was no need to fear a war with the northern states because control over cotton exports would make independent confederacy economically prosperous. When the Civil War broke out, the Union imposed a naval blockade, closing all Confederate ports to normal traffic. Consequently, the South was unable to move 95% of its cotton. Cotton diplomacy advocated by the Confederate diplomats James M. Mason and John Slidell failed because the Confederacy could not deliver its cotton, and the British economy was robust enough to absorb a depression in textiles from 1862 to 1864. After the Civil War, the future of Cottonland remained under Southern control. The economic importance of cotton had not diminished after the war. In fact, the federal government and northern capitalists were well aware that restoration of the cotton production was critical to the financial recovery of the nation. America regained its sought-after position as the world's leading producer of cotton. By 1870, sharecroppers, small farmers, and plantation owners in the American South had produced more cotton than they had in 1860, and by 1880, they exported more cotton than they had in 1860. After the Civil War had ended, life began to go back to a considerably more normal schedule of day-to-day -day events. However, the cotton industry was in for a change. Come the 1880s, a new wave of technological advances were accruing. Ideas of how to successfully satisfy supply and demand began. Towards the end of the 19th century, the influx of cotton mills began. With the help of railroads, transportation over long stretches was made easy and set to diversify the range of production. The factories may have been an efficient investment and the Civil War may have ended. However, this did not halt the unfair treatment of workers. Mill owners used a family labor system in which adults were paid less than a minimum wage. Unfortunately, with this, children were also hired and paid an even cheaper wage, documented as low as 32 to 50 cents a week. The segregation of white and blacks occurred in something called white domain, where white and black workers were to be kept in separate rooms of work. There was also the development of unequal pay between genders, where men were paid for more skilled and heavy work, and women were paid less for what was deemed semi to unskilled work, not to mention the extreme conditions they had to work under. Many people were burned, developed health issues, specifically respiratory, and some even died. 
This unfair treatment was not unnoticed and began to create disapproval among the workers. They would band together to create unions that would go on strike to riot and reveal their disapproval of, the tr of their treatment. Some of these strikes would last days or weeks, and eventually, come World War II, the nation would begin to see the demise of the cotton industry.